Welcome to the newborn lecture. One of my favorites simply because I finally get to meet my second patient. So throughout pregnancy, throughout labor, and you know the initial part of the delivery, all I can do is go with what the monitors are showing me for the health and safety of my patient, my second patient. So baby is finally delivered and I finally get to meet my second patient. And it's, they're the ugliest, most beautiful little creatures <laughs> ever. You see some little cream cheese in here, we'll talk about that. And I think this is a really good picture of a, a one just starting out. There's that baby Ambu bag that we just uh, uh, tossed around a little bit. Um, they're showing important things like the umbilical cord and the clamps we use for that. They're showing a molding in the head. They're showing how um, ID, ID, you know, patient ID is so important with a newborn. Um, so it's, I think it's a loaded picture um, and you'll appreciate all of it um, as we learn more. So I talked about all the different things that the mom had to like transition from pregnant to not pregnant anymore, all the different changes that take place. I have been in the business for a fair amount of time and I am still amazed at how much a newborn has to do in the first moments of life. Um, and, and they usually do it pretty well. That's nature at its finest, in my opinion. We're gonna talk about um, this newborn period, and technically, it's from birth to about the 28th day of life, so the first four weeks. Um, lots and lots going on. If you're ever stuck for a um, diagnosis on your care plans, um, like baby is perfectly healthy and everything's going well and we're not doing anything extra for the baby, um, we still do a whole lot for our babies, right? We monitor their temperature. We keep track of their, their feedings and their dirty diapers um, and all, of, you know, their respirations. And so all that is is monitoring the transition. So a good diagnosis is transition from intrauterine to extrauterine life. Pretty good, um, pretty good nursing diagnosis, and what kinds of things are we doing? We're gonna monitor temperature for thermoregulation. We're gonna monitor feedings for nutrition. We're gonna monitor diaper changes for you know the rest of the I and O part. So, um, so, so that's, that's a good diagnosis. You, you can thank me later. Um, respiratory and circulatory functions have to go from the inside to the outside, and Lots and lots changes um, with those two uh, systems that we'll talk more in detail about. Other body systems certainly have to transition, um, but it, the, those take a little bit longer and can take a little bit longer. Um, what happens, I, I don't think we're gonna have time, we might at the end have time to show a video of neonatal versus fetal circulation and all that has to happen. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, but just know that there are shunts in the fetal circulation. So when the baby is on the inside, mom is breathing for the baby, right? Mom is oxygenating the blood. Mom's liver is cleansing the blood. So the baby doesn't have to oxygenate their blood. They don't have to cleanse their blood. So there's no purpose in sending all the blood through the, the lungs, sending all the blood through the... Uh, liver because it doesn't have to go there. Um, a little bit gets sent to both areas for growth of the organs, but um, otherwise these shunts are in place to kind of bypass those areas. Um, and the minute the baby is born, uh, we clamp and cut the cord, um, increase pulmonary vascular resistance and the big yelp of a you know, cry from the baby, good respiratory effort. And all these shunts starts opening up, and it's, it's pretty amazing. Or I think it is, anyways. Um, the three shunts that I refer to are the ductus venosus, the foramen ovale, and then there's the ductus arteriosus. The ductus venosus diverts blood around the liver. The foramen ovale sends blood from the right atrium to the left atrium because it doesn't need to go uh, through the lungs. 
The ductus arteriosus diverts blood from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. All right. Um, and as I mentioned, the how and um, when all of those shunts start opening and or, or closing, technically. Um, and what happens? It's no surprise that based on all of this extra work and adjustment that the heart rate um, can be slightly higher at birth, so up to 180 beats per minute at birth. Otherwise, the average resting heart rate, it says 120 over 60 here. Uh, you can see, it, I think the book might say 110 over 160. A baby at complete rest, very deeply asleep, might actually drop even lower than 110. Um, anything above 100 really, um, as long as everything looks good, you know, respirations, color, and everything, I wouldn't worry too much about a, a, f a newborn heart rate uh, below 120 um, if a baby's deeply sleeping. This is for your, you visual folks, the, the whole uh, switching from uh, fetal to newborn circulation, I will not uh, confuse you further by going through it. Just know all those shunts are in place to divert through the liver and lungs. APGAR scoring. We give our babies one minute to figure it all out and then we start judging them. <laughs> right? It comes very easily to somebody like me. I'm a big judger. So all those shunts and all those, okay, now I have to breathe on my own, now I have to uh, uh, oxygenate my own blood. I have to do all these things. Um, I have to warm myself. I have to everything. We give them one minute to figure out and then we start assessing them or judging as I call it. So APGAR score is hugely important to, to be familiar with. I repeat, hugely important. All right. We, um, uh, Dr. Virginia APGAR, who was actually a, I think a pediatric anesthesiologist, found that these five categories, heart rate, respiratory rate, muscle tone, reflex irritability, and color, if we just kind of did a preliminary assessment um, looking at those five areas, we could pretty much tell how the baby was transi transitioning from the inside to the outside, okay? Um, and I think APGAR, they've taken her last name and, and also um, made it into some, and it might even be on, does anyone have their clinical packets with them? The folder? I think it says there, A stands for appearance, pulse, grittus, something, <laughs> <laughs> respirations, I don't know. They've, they've made it uh, even easier to remember, unless you're me, um, on all the different things to assess. We, we assess and we give them a score of zero, one, or two, all right? Let's go over them briefly. Heart rate, if there is no heart rate, they get a big fat zero, all right? If they have a heart rate but it's below 100, uh, which is slow, uh, we give them a one. If it's above 100, they get a perfect score for that too, okay? Respiratory effort, absolutely no respiratory effort, zero. If they're kind of gasping with some really kind of short, uh, irregular breaths, that would be uh, a score of one. And a good lusty cry, a vigorous cry, they can't be vigorously crying if they're not breathing well, okay? So if you hear a baby given a nice lusty cry, then, um, then we know that they're breathing well, okay? That would be two. Muscle tone. I have seen babies come out like rag dolls. Absolutely no muscle tone whatsoever. I don't ever want to see it again. But that's a flaccid baby with a score of zero, all right? Sometimes they have a little bit of muscle tone, but not very much. So you would take their arm and you that might be slightly bent and you'd straighten it out and then they wouldn't bring it right back up close, you know, they're just a little, um, some flexion, uh, that's a one. But active motion um, and mostly like tight and like this, this is how we like them. They wanna protect themselves and keep themselves warm. We know that's good, that's a um, score too. Reflex irritability. 
in short, how easily can we piss them off? All right. <laughs> Generally, what we do is we suction them because we need to clear their mouth and nose. So we'll suction their mouth and then we'll suction their nose. And if they like, <laughs> yeah, give us a big cry, we've pissed them off, off sufficiently. I think they deserve a two on that. All right. So vigorous crying when we do those things, that's, that's a two for both. If, you, if they're vigorously crying, then they would probably get a two for respiratory effort and reflex irritability, okay? Sometimes um, the reflex irritability, okay, so sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's flicking their, the bottoms of their feet, the soles of their feet. That's the way we do it now instead of slapping them on the butt like in <laughs> old-fashioned movies, hanging them upside down and slapping them on the butt. Anyone see old movies where they did that? That's pretty, um, there's some truth. Well, there's truth to that, but there's some purpose in that. Hanging them upside down drains their lungs up from all their fluid. Slapping them on the butt makes them cry vigorously, hopefully, in which then they would get things going. I don't recommend nor encourage you to hang a baby upside down and slap them on the butt, but that's what that's about. And then their color. Um, babies come out, uh, basically the color... Um, of your scrub tops, more or less, all right? Very quickly, they start pinking up as their um, newborn circulation kicks in, all right? Most often, a baby will be nice and pink in their body, but maybe their hands and their feet still have a little blue tint to them. Perfectly reasonable, especially at the one minute mark, all right? Um, that would give them a, a score of one. Completely pink. Hands and feet included is a two. I, ha I rarely see a perfect score of 10 at one minute, all right? Um, the most common would be like eight or nine. Nine would undoubtedly be one off for color because you can't have great color with one of these other things lacking, all right? So I would almost, I'd bet you a hundred bucks. I'm not much of a betting one, but I'm gonna bet you a hundred bucks. If we have a score, APGAR score of nine, it's one off for color, all right? I would become very familiar with this <laughs> scoring, all right? What do you say a whimpering cry would be? One. one. In a couple areas, right? Mm -hmm. Probably both in respiratory and uh, reflex irritability. Some flexion, also kind of one, right? Not active motion, nice and tight, okay? Get it? Mm -hmm. All right. Very familiar with this, and you will get at least one question right on next week's quiz. Don't want to give away all the surprises, but... <laughs> <clears throat> What's also... Why it's also important, not just for a quiz, is that when you're receiving rapport or handoff, um, about a newborn baby, uh, and I think I talked about this a little bit. Maybe I talked about it in uh, um, Sim Labs. But um, it, Baby Boy Smith born by C-section um, this morning at 8.02, APGARS 9.9. Nine. Like, that's the, like the first thing other than their demographics that they, they say to, how, how to describe the baby, all right? So... It's, uh, it's pretty relevant um, to the care of the newborn. All right, so they're born. We will most likely, um, pending any complications of either mom or baby, we'll take baby right out of the birth canal and boom, right up on mom's chest, all right? Um, skin to skin with mom is the best, absolute best place a newborn baby can be. Um, it's... Uh, 98.7 degrees, generally 98.6. I mean, it's a nice warm surface, right? Um, mom's breathing and heart rate might help regulate baby's breathing and heart rate. And they've been waiting a whole long time to, to meet this kid, right? Like, I don't need to meet the kid right away, you know? And what I do as a newborn nurse in a delivery room can be done from mom's chest. Uh, again, um, in the absence of any complications or um, predicted issues with baby, all right? Um, sometimes mom is unable, say with a C-section, 
uh, we might not be able to do that. Or if mom is, is having a t terrible um, trouble something and we can't safely put the baby there. Some moms say, I don't want to, until the baby's uh, like wiped off, I, I'd rather you not do that. Uh, they oftentimes change their mind after the, they meet their kid, but we go with what mom wants, all right? So it's a conversation, if, if possible, ahead of time to say, do you want your baby right on your chest after delivery? So we can listen to a heart rate. We can assess color. We can do all those things right from mom's chest. Um, remember, we're guests in this family's memory, and that will go a long way um, to start that family off on the right foot um, if we get them to meet their baby first. From the chest, we could really kind of do a pretty quick initial exam, just, you know, all arms, legs, fingers, toes, nothing protruding out of their abdomens or anything. Um, uh, oftentimes, a lot of uh, birth defects are are known ahead of time like if there's a, pr a problem with their intestines or anything like that they probably will have known ahead of time um so that we can be prepared uh for any special needs at delivery um we're going to look at their bellies we're going to uh, look at their umbilical cord uh reflexes being my favorite uh, assessment on a newborn um and any other observations uh just you know their gross structural formation their malformation a little bit later on, what we'll do is we will um, assess their gestational age. Gestational age is how long they cooked, all right? How long they were in the oven, all right? Um, full term is considered uh, completed 37th week and forward, and, you know, 38, 39, 40, all right? Um, anything between... Uh, we'll say 35 and 37 completed weeks is considered um, late preterm and then anything below 35 is uh, preterm all right now a baby who is either late preterm or preterm might have some special needs really really preterm very premature babies clearly have um, special needs in terms of thermoregulation and possibly breathing support, that sort of thing. Um, it's those middle of the road kids who look like they are full term, but they're gonna have a little trouble with feeding, with temperature regulation, maybe keeping up their blood sugars because they're working really hard um, because they, they weren't quite done cooking yet and they were boring, all right? So those are the ones that the gestational age assessment is so important on, all right? We can have a baby who is, uh, who, upon quick glance, looks like they could be full-term, all right? So maybe we're going to treat them like a full-term baby. And they might get lost in the shuffle, struggling to keep their body temperature up and burning off the extra brown fat and then having their blood sugars drop and not really eating very well. All those different things that are kind of like um, not on the you know, PowerPoint until the end of their gestation, right? They might not know how to do those things quite as well as we would expect, okay? So we don't want these, we don't want these babies to, to fall through the cracks. Yet they might be the same size physically, like weight and stuff, as a baby that is full term, all right? Do you see where, where it's so important to, to know where they are in their gestation? And some people can be wrong in terms of, of their dates. They might have remembered differently or um, there could have been a delay in their ovulation or something along those lines. Um, I'll give you an example. I was 15 days late um, having my child um, who clearly was not overdue at her birth. And if you went back on the dates that I know for sure were my last menstrual period dates and whatnot, um, I conceived when my husband was in Dallas, Texas. I was in Connecticut. Hmm. That doesn't seem right, does it? No, because I, my, I delayed ovulation until my mate returned. Honestly, it's such a thing. Um, and I welcomed him home. Anyways. <laughs> sorry, YouTube. Sorry, Tori. I don't keep watching this. Um, <laughs> welcome home, Daddy. Uh, anyways. 
that was going in the other direction, but somebody could ovulate early, maybe it's around the holidays and stress, whatever. There's a whole lot that can affect timing of ovulation. So even if they're off by a week or two, just think if they're actually two weeks earlier than they expect, and then they, they um, go into labor two weeks earlier than their due date, now we're talking four weeks off their full term, right? If they are, so now that baby might definitely have special needs, all right? There's a uh, more in-depth assessment that we can do um, that initially takes into account certainly their weight, their length, their head and chest circumference, but it goes a little bit deeper than that um, to the to heart of the matter to find out just where we think they fall in terms of gestational age. It's a newborn maturity scale, um, and it looks at neuromuscular and physical maturity as uh, well. We the best place to to really get a good firm grasp on the bal on the um, the, the assessment scale is BallardScore.com. It's a really good online reference that shows you, if you're interested, shows you examples of like what full term looks like, what preterm looks like, what extremely preterm looks like. I'm not gonna ask for you to be um, as, as uh, proficient in uh, scoring a baby in the Ballard score, like the APGAR score, but it's important for you to know what kinds of things we are looking for um, in terms of gestational age assessment. We're gonna look at the baby's posture. Is the baby nice and crunched and like keeping themselves warm like that? That's how we want. We want the babies like that, not kind of all out, uh, just kind of laying limp, all right? The square window formation is actually, we push their, um, their hands down and bent at the wrist um, and measure the angle that their their hand versus their forearm makes. Um, arm recoil, again, when babies all bundled up like this or uh, flexed like this, we pull their arm out and we count how long it takes for them to bring it back to their bodies. The more preterm they are, the longer it takes for them to, to flex it back up close to their body. Popliteal angle is a, um, their knee angle and we are kind of like practically bending them in half and watching when their knee bends in that whole process. Again, BallardScore.com is a great resource. Scarf sign, we're um, wrapping their arm around their neck and we're watching to see how far um, across their chest, their elbow goes when you, we meet resistance. The more preterm, the further that, that um, elbow goes across their chest. And heel to ear is another bend them in half and <laughs> not, not quite. But um, it's really looking at muscular um, flexibility more than anything. Skin texture. A baby, uh, a newborn baby at full term, um, their skin is, um, while it's still fragile, um, has, has some substance to it, okay? Has anyone ever seen an extremely premature baby? where their skin looks like you could, it could just tear by touching it. Very, very fragile and translucent almost, okay? So we're looking at skin texture. Lanugo is, um, is a fine downy hair on a baby's body. Um, the very preterm baby has, has a lot of it. Um, it goes away for a little while, and then towards the end, um, some hair might come back. Um, so it's... it's um, a little bit more um, prevalent, however, in the uh, preterm baby. Uh, breast tissue amount, the older they are gestationally, uh, the more breast tissue they will have. Um, just like kittens and, and puppies, when they're first born, they, or their eyes are fused, well, if they're extremely premature, um, a, a human baby's eyes might not be fully um, opened yet, all right? Um, uh, as well as the cartilage in their ears stiffens up um, as their gestations uh, uh, increase, okay? So you know how uh, most of our ears are, um, although a couple of you have the uh, ears flapping out like Dumbo. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not looking at any of you in particular. Um, most, of, most of us have ears that are 
uh, kind of stiff, I mean bendable, but stiff um, with the folds in them. Uh, a, an extremely premature baby's ear cartilage will be pretty floppy and they won't have the folds in them that are formed anyways. Um, that comes later in gestation. Um, and genitalia development, um, certainly um, the more preacher, the more gestationally mature they are, uh, the more mature their genitals are, including um, both testes descended into the scrotum for a male baby, um, labia covered by the, uh, or covering the clitoris in the um, female baby. So a post-term baby is someone who's overdue, born after the completion of 42 weeks. That's m technically my kid, because it was 42 and one. Post-mature is the same gestation, but then they're showing signs that the placenta had only signed on for about 40 weeks and was like up on the contract. They are not, um, necessarily hearty, healthy looking kid because the placenta stopped working, right? So these are kids who are almost, they could actually lose weight and, and like their skin could be a little uh, like sagging. You know, they've lost, actually, actually lost weight. Their skin is usually dry and cracked. Like they really, they should have been evicted um, a little bit sooner, okay? That's post-mature. <laughs> this is some pictures here. This is what you see in the nurseries in terms of that's what we go off of when we're scoring for the gestational age um, and um, different things we need to consider are maternal complications, all right? If mom's, mom had some medical condition like gestational diabetes or high blood pressure, that might have affected the intrauterine environment. Um, and they maybe they weren't getting um, as much nutrition um, or oxygen as they would have um, in an uncomplicated pregnancy. So all those things we have to take into account. These are some pictures. That's the square window formation. And this is the scarf sign. You see how in a full-term baby, the elbow goes almost to the center of the chest, whereas in this one, it's much further across. So what we do is uh, we know, okay, the kid is scoring at 37 weeks gestation, we'll say. So we plot that out down here, 37. And then we look at their actual weight in grams, and we figure out where they fall um, in terms of wh what gestation we think they're at, and are they large for gestational age? Are they average for that gestational age or are they small for gestational age? Um, this is important because we could have a large for gestational age baby who's 34 weeks, who looks like a full-term baby, right? Or we can have a full-term baby who is small for gestational age who looks to be earlier than that, you know? So we just have to... Um, we have to plot them out on this to see if they uh, might uh, trick anybody, all right? A large for gestational age baby might have trouble ma maintaining their blood sugars too. Even if they look to be the right size, like a seven and a half pound baby, which is pretty good. Well, that seven and a half pound baby is only 34 weeks gestation. Well, we better be checking their blood sugars because that's a large for gestational age baby. Just one example. Pretty much says it there. Um, we worry about our low birth weight babies, which is 2,500 grams or less. We certainly, um, oftentimes we suspect ahead of time with prenatal care and ultrasounds and whatnot, but intrauterine growth restriction um, is something that is concerning, certainly during pregnancy. Um, some women are induced um, and delivered early because they figure the outside it's gonna be more optimal for growth and development than the inside, all right? Whether it's a placenta issue or a nutrition issue, uh, we're not sure. But intrauterine growth restriction, or IUGR, um, is uh, a concern that will um, guide our care. 
as I mentioned, term is anything from basically the 38th, the beginning of the 38th week to the end of the 42nd week. Premature is any baby born before the 37th completed week. Um, and like I, I mentioned, that late preterm is that middle ground there where they're considered preterm but not extremely premature. On to chapter 24. Uh, the respiratory rate uh, for a, a normal, healthy newborn is anywhere between 30 and 60. All right, it's pretty irregular, so we should listen to it and obsess it for, for a full minute, if not a half a minute. Heart rate, again, we'll say anywhere between 100 to 160 with an initial increase right after birth. Um, and then we got to look at um, the fluctuations to act depending on activity. You know, if baby is dead, dead is the wrong word, deep asleep, uh, the heart rate should be lower, just like ours probably is. And if they're very active and crying, you would expect that heart rate to be higher. All right? We do listen. You do your best to palpate a pulse. God bless you if you can find it. And count it. You might be able to palpate it, but can you actually count it? It's pretty gosh darn quick. Who's, who's listening to a baby heart rate so far? A couple of you right? Uh, it goes pretty quick. So, um, and even listening to it is not always easy, right? Um, you should listen at the um, apical point um, for a full minute. You can listen in a couple of different spots on their um, chest so that, because uh, a murmur you might find a little bit in different spots on the chest. Um, just based on where it is. Um, don't ask me to help you with murmurs. I can't hear them. I cannot hear them. I, I have heard them, but it's a miracle when I hear them. They have to be basically saying, murmur, <laughs> murmur, for me to hear it. I'm sorry, I, it's just my weakness. I openly admit it. Temperature should be uh, axillary temp or under the armpit is the preferred method of uh, assessing a temperature. We would expect an axillary temp um, to be anywhere between 97.7 and 98.9. All right. If it's b above or below that, uh, we'll probably, um, probably recheck a, a rectal temp. Um, but we avoid the rectal temp unless we have to um, in these cases. While blood pressure is not a routine vital sign, um, we certainly can assess, like I showed you that little blood pressure cuff that went around. Um, and blood pressures, uh, normal blood pressure in a newborn is 60, 80, over 40 to 50. I will say, uh, if you can hear a murmur without my help, um, they're usually benign. Like, if you heard a murmur on me, then you should be concerned. But a newborn baby, remember all those shunts I talked about? Well, because they might stick a little bit or whatever, they are, um, most often a murmur is transient and benign, all right? So you could hear it uh, shortly after birth, and even later that day or, you know, 12 hours later, you, it may have already resolved because it was related to that early transition. As I mentioned, axillary temp is a great way to assess uh, um, newborn temperature. Um, if they are under the, the warmer uh, for any period of time, we will put a, a temp probe on them. Um, and it's just literally um, monitoring the surface temp of the whatever area is facing the lights, the warming lights above them. All right, and we have these little cute, oftentimes they're little ducks or hearts. Uh, little stickers that we hold the um, temp probe on. Uh, why do we do that? Well, those, um, those warming lights are most in the newer models are pretty sophisticated. And they, will, they will monitor the baby's surface temperature and adjust the heat of the lamp based on what it is. That's pretty cool, huh? At a minimum, they will alarm if the baby's temp is either too high or too low. We set, 
parameters and it'll tell us, whoa, this baby's too cold or this baby's getting too hot. All right? If you're busy resuscitating a baby and you're not necessarily, temperature is not necessarily at the top of your list of things to be, you know, we're trying to get the baby to breathe, that sort of thing, it might kind of fall off the priority list. And the last thing we need to do is chill a baby out or overheat a baby who's already compromised because of uh, a rough start. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So generally, we have the luxury of kind of knowing the background on a baby prior to its arrival, right? Background meaning the mother, all right? We know the uh, complications uh, mom may have experienced. We know mom's medical history, um, any medications that mom is on, how the pregnancy went, how the delivery is going, that sort of thing. That, that's really important to gather. You'll see on your, um, on your concept maps, a lot of what um, a newborn concept map is about is about mom. Relevant medical uh, med surge history on a newborn would be completely blank, I would imagine. But med surge history on mom might be pertinent on baby. Right, like say, yeah. Would a C-section count in that section? Sure, why not? We can put that in there. Um, so would maternal hypothyroidism. Oh, that might have some relevance to the baby. All right, diabetes on mom. That would be relevant on baby. So med surge history, me, um, medicines, I suppose if mom was on methadone or heroin, that would be something relevant to the baby, right? Um, lab work, I'm just going around the concept map. Lab work, well, if a baby has had any lab work, it's not very extensive, generally. You might get a blood type, perhaps, but mom's lab work is so important. Mom's blood type, mom's groupy strep status. Did mom have antibiotics in labor? If, if she's groupy strep positive, or is baby at risk for an infection. Um, is mom HIV positive, hepatitis B positive? You see how, how that's more pertinent than some other labs um, we might have gotten on baby. Um, so those things are really important. So we're gathering the information on the outside of, the, uh, outside of that concept map um, in terms of history um, on uh, mom while we're waiting to meet our second patient, all right? Um, that middle section there, we're going to get the demographics. We're going to find out how, when, um, and any complications of birth, how, how and when they were born. Um, and within the first hour or four, the first couple of hours, we're going to do a full head-to-toe assessment on the baby. All right? Initially, the APGAR score, you know, one minute and at five minutes. Some hospitals... Do a 10-minute APGAR score as well. I know Griffin does. Um, other hospitals, such as Midstate and Manchester, I think, only do a 10-minute APGAR score, score if the first or five-minute APGAR score was really low. They'll probably follow up with an, a five minutes later doing it again just to make sure that that APGAR score is increasing. All right? If we can, and if parents are able, include them in the assessment. Remember, we got two days to teach them everything, all right? They're taking this little creature home, so it's really best if they know what's normal, what's not normal, what they can expect, um, and when to call the doctor. Might as well get started right away, all right? Nothing's worse, and I think they did studies, especially when they were um, really pressing the rooming in concept, which has occurred in my time. It's That's like like normal now, but back in the day, they used, to, they used to meet their babies for a period of time and then the babies would get shipped off to the nursery. So at some point they did a, some study as to perception of time separated, all right? So a, a mother separated from their newborn babies perceived the time away from the baby to be significantly longer than the actual time the baby was away. Makes sense, right? Um, and what did they do to their baby? What on earth did you do to my baby when, when we were apart? So why not 
do it all um, in the room with mom and dad um, and start the education on uh, what we're looking at, what's normal, what is abnormal or what would be abnormal and when to call or if they get home and see a bluish tint around the mouth or you know something along those lines. Again, part of that um, full assessment is a gestational age assessment. All right. We're going to look at their posture, their skin. What color is it? Is it uh, appropriate for their race? No matter what race they are, um, if you blanch their skin, I usually do that on their foreheads, their underlying skin tone should be pink. All right? That just says they have good oxygenation, right? So we want to blanch their... Um, blanch their skin to see the underlying skin tone. Their head, uh, we measure their head and chest in centimeters. Um, oftentimes on the little crib cards, we'll put it in inches because America is weird. Um, but head, head and um, chest circumference should be done in centimeters. A head should be two to three centimeters larger than the chest. If it's way smaller, then we worry about like um, a microcephaly or anencephaly. If it's way larger, then we worry about um, like a hydrocephaly, okay? So, so you know, a, a overdevelopment or fluid on the, on the brain. We're also looking at the fontanelles, which, is the so which are the soft spots. You're going to find a larger diamond-shaped one in the front, the anterior fontanelle. And then the posterior fontanelle is a smaller one in the back. It's kind of triangular, much smaller. We would expect these fontanelles to be flat. Not sunken in, not bulging out, but flat. All right. The newborn head is an amazing feature. Unlike you and I, I hope, at this point, uh, a newborn head can actually mold to the tight-fitting space that they're getting uh, out of, right? So have you ever seen a newborn baby with a cone head, right? That's nature's way of allowing a large object to pass through a smaller space, all right? Um, the seams in the, of the skull bones are actually movable, all right? Um, and the sutures, if you will, that's what the seam really is, is a suture. After um, a baby's born, you might see the molding or the, the cone head there. Um, and as that is resolving, you might feel ridges at the seams of the skull bones, all right? That's called overriding sutures. I repeat, overriding sutures. Those ridges are just the skull bones kind of going back to a normal round head shape, all right? There's some um, other findings of the head that we'll, we will uh, discuss at na ad nauseum, <laughs> at length. Um, Caput secadaneum versus cephalohematoma. Two different skull or scalp findings um, that are both very different but may look the same upon brief uh, glance. Okay, so we'll talk, we will in a moment talk uh, about the differences between the two of those. We want to look at their eyes. Are they symmetrical, spaced properly um, on their face? God bless you as well as their ears, their cartilage. Are they, do they have any skin tags or, or openings on their um, outside of their ears, um, as well as the placement um, in relation to their eyes? Low-set ears um, could be a sign of Down syndrome. All right. So here's the molding we talked about. Those are the fontanelles that I spoke of. You would expect, as I mentioned, the head circumference to be two to three centimeters larger than the chest. All right, a cephalohematoma is actually a collection of blood between the skull bone and the periosteum, all right? Those heads take a beating on the way out, right? We might even uh, put a suction cup on and, like, pull them out with a vacuum extractor. So, ow, right? So, so no surprise that some skulls might get, or some scalps might have a bruising. That's really what it is, is bruising. It's blood collected, um between those layers. The issue is the periosteum um, actually uh, um, is seamed at the skull, at the sutures, all right? So it's underneath that, that area, which means a cephalohematoma 
will not cross the suture line because it's underneath the seam, all right? This becomes important in a minute. A cap, cap it is just simply swelling of the scalp. That will cross the suture line. It's just generalized swelling in the scalp, scalp area. It could actually look the same as a cephalohematoma. Thank you. Um, but it is not because it is um, on top of those seams. Does that make sense? The caput is f just fluid, not blood. Cephalohematoma is blood, and it's underneath the seam, so it will not cross the suture line. 